to everyone at thank you to everyone at DeFiore. Did I say that right? Close. DeFiore. <laughs> D Fiori, D. I said, okay, D. Okay, sorry. I have to say this name a few times. So. It's okay. Um, <laughs> thank you to everyone at D Fiori for, um, you know, from Lori Abkemeyer, Miriam Altshuler, who's been wonderful to work with, Rayco Davis, Brian D Fiori, and thank Karen you. Karmatz Ruddy for taking time this evening to be with us. We're really grateful. Um, it's, okay. it's Rudy, Karen Carmen's Rudy. <laughs> I answer to anything. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. And I didn't think, I didn't think. Reiko, That's you were okay. the big one. I asked, I asked Miriam about you like way ahead of time. But, um, Rudy. Okay. Um, all right. We got that out of the way. So um, yeah. And thank you always to Jenna Farley Fleming, Senior Associate Director of Diversity Engagement at Columbia's Office of Alumni and Development. We could not do this without you. And thank you to our audience for sharing your evening with us. We have a lot to get to and everyone's sent in great questions. So let's introduce our panelists. Um, Brian, why don't you start? Because maybe you could also say a word about um, what representation by Tefior offers that's unique from other agencies. And, and for the rest of you, if you want to say what's, um, what kind of books you represent, what's on your wish list, or anything else that you would like, just to um, say hello to everyone. Brian, I pass it to you. OK, thanks. Um, yeah, hi, everybody. I'm Brian DeFiori. And uh, I started the agency a little over 20 years ago now. I kept thinking we'd have a 20th anniversary party, and then COVID hit. So uh, now I'm hoping maybe a 25th anniversary party. I keep, uh, we'll see. Um, but in any event, I did it after uh, about a 20 year career on the publishing side of things, working in book publishing companies, starting from literally uh, my first job was answering phone calls from my rate booksellers at St. Martin's Press when they didn't get the right number of copies in their order to uh, being a publisher of a division of uh, Random House. Um, so I came up through the publishing side of things and uh, learned a lot there about what makes the market work, what uh, the kind of books that I seem to have a good sensibility uh, for and brought that into uh, agenting. So when I started the agency, it was sort of just me in a little office by myself over the course of those 20 odd years. Uh, it's become an agency of 16 people total these uh, three fantastic people who are here with me and several other agents who couldn't couldn't join us tonight. Though the four of us do uh, a little more fiction than many of the others who aren't here, which is why we are here. Um, and I, I, listen, the thing about agencies that make them unique is the people who work at them. Um, the truth is every single agent is unique uh, as we all, all are as people, of course, but uh, the job, for a writer and connecting with an agent primarily is finding the one person who will uh, connect with you and your work and your sensibility and who you trust. Um, so my primary job in, in running this agency was finding people who I thought really were good, were good at that and would, uh, would, would honor their clients and their clients' wishes. But um, the one thing I think does make us stand out a little bit from others is um, several of us started our career on the publishing side of things. As I said, I ran a division of uh, Random House. My colleague, Lisa Gallagher, ran a division of HarperCollins. Karen ran a division of uh, what was then known as Warner Books. And, and Lori Abkemeyer was a senior editor at, uh, at Hyperion. And, and others, Chris Park was at uh, was a, a different division of Warner Books. So several of us have been on the publishing side of things. And I think really knowing what goes on inside publishing houses and what editors face in the uh, job of acquiring books helps us give our clients a little bit of a leg up in, um, in uh, making that, uh, that move. Fabulous, thank you. That's, that sure. was really interesting. Um, Karen. Hi, um, I'm Karen Carmatz Rudy, and um, I have been at DeFiori for 12 years now. And uh, before that, I was an editor at uh, what's Grand Central now and was Warner Books at the beginning for 17 years. And they told me there wouldn't be a whole lot of math in this career, but 
even I know that that adds up to almost 30 years in publishing, which is terrifying to me. Um, but I um, was an editor for a very long time and switched over to be an agent and thought, I don't know if I can do this because what I love more than anything is the editing process. And it turns out that as an agent, there is as much of that as one could humanly handle. Um, and I think that is probably what I bring to the table that's slightly different from some other agents out there, which is I will go through many, many drafts with my, um, particularly my novelists. I do about 60% fiction, 60% nonfiction. I specialize in book club fiction. Sometimes I go more literary. Sometimes I go a little more commercial. Um, I'm always looking, as is everyone, for that sweet spot. That's a little bit of both. Um, and on the nonfiction side, I do women's interests, nonfiction, um, narrative nonfiction, some memoir, um, some prescriptive. Um, and I think the thing that sets me apart and most of us at DeFiori is we are really fierce advocates for our authors. And for me, I think I'm able to foresee some of the pitfalls that they would go through in a publishing house. And I know as many of us do that editors are often looking for a reason not to buy something. And so we try very hard to take those reasons away from them so that they just fall in love with a book and buy it and publish it very well, we hope. So that's me and I'll pass it along. Well, wonderful, thank you. Miriam. I'm Miriam Altshuler. Um, I have been an agent my whole career. I have not been on the publishing side, so I value having my wonderful colleagues uh, because one of the things that I love about having joined DeFiori um, about seven years ago, um, is that I have great colleagues and we discuss things. Um, we have a kind of wonderful, healthy competition, uh, but also a, a very supportive group of people. And there's always people to bring their expertise and point of views with, um, you know, to any situation. So I have really valued that. I started uh, at an agency that is now defunct, but was one of the oldest, most successful of the kind of long running um, literary agencies, Russell and Falconine, and worked with people like Joseph Campbell and Ann Tyler and Bernard Malamud and um, Nadine Gordimer and Barbara Tuckman and Annie Dillard. And it was just a kind of an incredible place to start. And I did all the sub rights. I had my authors. I ran the agency for almost 13 years. And then I left and started my own agency which I had for 21 years um, and Reiko worked with me there. And then we both joined DeFiori together. Um, and it's just been a kind of a, a wonderful supportive place, as I said, and it's been great in the, as, in the changing times of publishing um, to kind of have that support. I, I do believe very much so you can be an independent agent. I did it because to have that support, but also having ran my own agency for so many years, I wanted to kind of get really focus my time exclusively on really being an agent and not running the company as much and doing all the um, contracts and foreign and all the things that come along with representing writers. And it's just been great to kind of be able to parcel that out to such terrific colleagues here and to be able to focus my attention on my books. Um, like Karen, um, I do commercial literary fiction um, by also finding that sweet spot. Um, I go, I can go quite literary, but I can also go really commercial, like people like Jill Santopolo, who's a client of mine, uh, who is a Columbia graduate. Um, and I do a lot of memoirs. I do narrative nonfiction. I do a little self-help, but less, more where there's a, kind of a real basis for research in it. Um, I really feel that the books I look for both on my fiction and my nonfiction are books that have a real heart and that bring something new to a conversation. Um, I also represent middle grade and YA uh, writers. Um, I represented and worked with Walter Dean Myers for over 30 years and continue to also look for new voices, diverse voices, and people who kind of just bring a new outlook to a topic. So that's that's what I will say about me. Wow, what a wealth of experience you guys bring. Oh my goodness, I won't ask you when you sleep. Reiko. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm, I'm Reiko Davis, um, and I've been at DeFiori since 2016. Uh, like Miriam said, I started my career in agenting as her assistant for many years. And then when she, um, she had her own agency and when she came over to DeFiori, I went with her um, and began to build my own client list, which is really exciting. Um, I um, focus mostly on literary fiction um, on the adult side. I do, I work with a lot of debut novelists or um, short um, interlinked story collections. I love uh, historical, contemporary, generate multi-generational novels, um, coming of age stories, anything that really um, grapples with identity. Um, I also love working with diverse authors from diverse backgrounds. Um, uh, one of my, my bigger clients, Debbie S. Laskar, is, is a Columbia MFA graduate. Um, and I do some narrative nonfiction, um, mostly that uh, some memoir. Um, and I also do work on the children's side quite a bit. And on the children's side, I do some YA, but mostly um, middle grade fiction and nonfiction. Um, and I think you guys covered it about how, what kind of sets De Fiori apart, I guess, from the slightly younger generation um, and someone who's come from purely the agenting side. It's, it's been great to, the mentorship and the ability to lean on the brain trust that is why we form agencies because agenting can be a bit of a lonely siloed process. And so I think the culture at DeFiori has always been extremely collegiate and supportive. Um, and, um, you know, colleagues you, you can go to for advice if you're, if you're, you know, dipping a toe outside of your normal space or genre when you're really excited about something, um, that's been, I think, the most the most valuable and exciting thing for me uh, at the agency. Well, thank you. Boy, um, you guys, I think it's a testament that you've all stayed as long as you had. You know, you've all kind of haven't been, it's not a revolving door, which is actually very nice in today's world. Um, so that's, um, very exciting to hear from you. Um, the we'll go to our questions. Uh, the question, the topic we overwhelmingly got questions about, which is probably not going to come as a surprise to you, is the querying process. And there is a lot of information available on your website, so people absolutely should go there. And um, now that they've met you and have a sense, they can look on each um, agent's page, um, and and the particulars are there. However. There are still some questions um, that might be really helpful to get your guys' take on. Uh, maybe Melissa can get us started. Melissa Bell, um, let's get Melissa on here. Okay, let's, there she is, awesome. Hi, Melissa. What's your question Hi. for the agents? Hi, everybody. Well, we know that the query letter is really important. And so could you tell us what you'd like to see in the query letter? and what should the structure be and how long and what should it include? That's a great, great place to start. And you know what, maybe we're gonna go the opposite way. So why don't we start with you, Reiko, and, um, and then, you know, the other, everyone else can jump in if they would like. But unmute, you gotta unmute. I, I would say that um, the query letter is, has to, of explain but also evoke a project. So there's like a very artsy element to it, but also a purely functional functional one as well. And sometimes that's kind of challenging uh, line to toe. Um, but typically the the structure is like the connection, um, the the pitch, and then the author bio. So the connection meaning doing your research about reaching out to that agent. If you don't have know them personally, maybe you um, read an interview by them or attended the same conference like or this panel um, where you heard us or um, um, what was I going to say? Um, but the, the connection and then the, the pitch, which is really, um, I think of like flap copy. So very concise, short and sweet. I think maybe the one mistake writers 
make is going into too much excruciating detail. It should be just um, like a couple short paragraphs at most with the, the story arc, the main characters, what's at stake. And then the author bio, which is where you know you you put in your background if you have a connection to the subject you're writing about, if what's your educational background, your your platform if you have one. Sometimes debut authors don't. And then your writing credits if you've published previously in in literary magazines or journals, um, which sort of I think points to your um, your participation in the literary community at large. Um, okay, thank you. And and any of the others want to add to that? Can I'm going to just jump in Oh, um, and say there are a couple of things that I think you really should try to do and a couple of things that you really shouldn't try to do in a pitch letter, um, in a submission letter. And um, I always tell people, friends who are looking to pitch, that um, flattery will really get you everywhere, right? And so if you are trying to catch the attention of an agent and you can explain to them why you came to that particular agent, it lets that agent know that you have actually done your homework. And when you do this, um, I can always tell when somebody is sincere and has really dug in and when they have just Googled me and found some various things, because if they um, mention a list of books that I've uh represented and they say you know similarly to these six books my book is something completely different i think you didn't read those books and you have no idea whereas i've had people who have said the line in this book that i have never let go is this and the fact that you as an agent could see that and nurture that talent makes me think, oh, look at that. They sort of see what I saw there and that's, and I'm likely to read a little more closely. So I think if you can do that, it's a, it's a great leg up. And the one thing that I will say that you should not do, uh, well, there are two things. One is, um, and this happens to me all the time because I have a ridiculous name, but try to get the agent's name correct. That's helpful because you are a writer and we think that you should be able to look up what somebody's name is. Um, and I also, some people might be okay with this. I am very, very averse to people um, putting an attachment in their submission letter because I don't know you. You could very easily be sending me a virus. My um, IT person will tell me not to open an attachment from someone I don't know. So please, just paste whatever you need to do in that query letter. And I promise I will read it without, and if I like what you're doing, I will trust you enough to say, now you can send me an attachment. But um, unless somebody says to you specifically on their page, on their website, attachments are fine, I would caution against sending an attachment because I just won't open it. And I would say most agents are very clear about that, right? I mean, they, again, if you read carefully the submission guidelines, they will they will say, you just fall, you know, you, you have to re really follow what they actually say. I mean, and the only thing I totally agree with both of these things, I will just emphasize the short because I get probably 100 to 150 queries a week. And I get a lot because I'm a little bit more of a generalist than some agents. But I really, it's almost impossible to really go, you know, through everything anymore. And so it's, it's all about us asking to read the book. You don't need to tell us, you know, I might, if I like something, I do ask for 10 page, first 10 pages of a manuscript like Karen, not as an attachment, because I also want to see with the writing style of the page. But I don't want to go through a long query to kind of figure out what a book is about. The flap copy element, which is what I'm looking for. And, you know, I always say at conferences, go and sit at a bookstore um, and read the flap copy of 100 books. Just absorb what it's like to pitch a book, what it is that you're trying to find, what I call the heart of the book. And make that very clear in your cover letter. Short and sweet. If we love your cover, we'll ask for it. The more you write, the more we're going to just feel kind of tuned out, I think, and go on to the next person. And so our time is short. We do most of this kind of reading at nights and weekends. Not During the day, we're really managing our emails and our authors and the, and the work. 
And so, you know, keep us entertained and keep it focused. Okay. I will just add, Melissa, you're one of your questions, one of the points of your question, you said, what is the structure? And I almost want to say, please don't structure it. Don't structure it. And whenever, in fact, I get a query that feels like it's been too through a process of writing a query letter, I'm already zoning out on it. Like the best query, I, I often say to the young people in the agency when they're going through a training period, I, I say, if a letter can't keep my attention, why should I believe 300 pages by this person can keep my attention? So the issue is just write enough to keep someone's attention, make it personal, make it as pithy as you possibly can. The best query letter I think I ever got, which actually turned into be a client uh, that I represented and sold this book for in, in an auction. And it was a quite successful first literary novel came. It was literally, I think, five sentences long. I don't remember it exactly, but it was basically, I've, I've just, the, the, um, obviously the opening line is a good one. I just, I just graduated from the Iowa Writers Workshop, which of course gave him a little bit of credibility. And this novel won their best first novel award. It's the fictional memoir of the world's first talking chimpanzee. Are you interested? How could you say anything but yes? Of course I'm interested. That's a perfect query letter. Okay, wow, interesting. Um, yeah, she's- Can I add one more thing? Yeah. Um, I would also say, cause I've been noticing this in queries, um, define up front what the genre is, like don't leave it up to the agent to determine or like guess at. So if, if you're writing children's, is this middle grade or YA? And if you're an adult doing adult fiction, is it literary, upmarket, commercial? Um, I just find that it just it just helps us slot it into, you know, um, a bucket that we that's how we think about books when we pitch them and how editors and publishers think about it. That's really helpful, Reiko. And along those lines, um, none of you mentioned the comps. Um, how important are they? Um, they're hard to, they're really one of the hardest things for a writer, you know, to come up with those comps. Um, and do you care whether they're in the beginning or at the end? Like, I think in the beginning, you do you want like word count? You just genre, I mean, just sort of like, so you're going to go through it really fast. You can kind of go boom, boom, boom. Do the comps factor into that? I think comps can be sometimes helpful. It also gets, I, for me, it's partially um, makes me kind of give a little insight to how much an author understands the business too. I mean, if you're writing a kid's book and all you use is Harry Potter and, you know, Philip Pullman, I, I just feel like you're not a reader. I, I'm not that those aren't good books to read, but it, you haven't extended your place into books that are kind of a more general, you know, are, are, are books that are successful, but not necessarily blockbuster. And so I want book, but it does help us to see how a writer sees their books with their comps and where you would position it in a bookstore, which is ultimately such an important part of the process. Uh, but if you only do books that are extraordinarily successful, that doesn't really help us. And if you list books that we've never, like really are so obscure and done by smaller houses that, will absolutely have value in, in that area, but aren't necessarily who, what an agent would represent. We really look at the larger publishing houses as the place that we're going to sell our books. I think it's, you know, it's important for us to see how you look at your book and the comps in terms of, do you understand, you know, how you see your book and where you would see your book on a bookshelf? So we don't need the, you know, it, it listed as the Harry Potter and the you know, Stephen King necessarily, but we want to have a way to kind of see where you see a book on a bookshelf. And I think it is helpful to us to both see that and to understand how a writer understands the business, which is a very central part of publishing world these days is, is having the collaborative nature, you know, collaborative relationship with an author. And the more they understand the business, the better it's going to be for everybody at this point. I would go on to say, I think, oh, sorry, Karen. I think comps, I think coming up with comps is more important at a later stage when we are talking with the author about how to position it for a publisher. 
I think for a query letter, the only need for a comp is if you it really somehow illustrates for the agent something you're trying to do that might not have enough. Like like if you wanted to say uh, if this um, uses a bit of uh, magical realism in the same way that it was found in um, nothing to see here, for example. You know, like something that might help the help the agent say, "Oh, that's what he's trying to do," rather than, "Oh, it's the, like these, it's like these other books." Because at this at that stage, it's not all that helpful. All you really want the agent to do is be intrigued enough to want to read it, because that's your goal with the query letter: make us want to read it. The rest of it doesn't really matter. We have to just want to read it. And Karen, did you want to say something? And you're you're muted. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, I was just gonna say to me, a comp is only helpful if it's something surprising, something unusual, right? Something that sort of, you know, I, it's not that I want people to follow the format of like, if this movie and this novel mated, this would be their, you know, redheaded stepchild, right? I, I, it's not that I want that formula, but I would like somebody to tell me something, it, it, you can talk about a, a, a best-selling book if you bring in another book that's a little more obscure, but still in the zeitgeist enough for me to know it, and, and they have nothing to do with each other, and you're explaining to me how those two triangulate, you know, how you, how you actually get at something with the marriage of those two. Otherwise, I agree with Brian. It's for later. I don't. I don't need it. And I feel like sometimes it can be a little lazy because it's showing me that you can't pitch your own story um, in your own. I, I always like for somebody's pitch to match the voice of their fiction, right? So, like, if you can't tell this in an unusual and interesting enough a way, and you're relying on, yeah, it's it's like. I don't know, Bridget Jones's diary, just like that. That doesn't give me a lot, right? And so I just, I want people to be a little more creative about it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and we, Michael Hirsch had a question, but Michael, I don't know, have we answered? Um, maybe we've covered your question, but is there is there anything you wanna add in terms of asking? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you have covered a lot uh, of what I was going to ask. I, I guess I would, just add is you know is there are there any other common mistakes um that you see authors would be author, authors making uh either in their query letter or in the sample pages so you could talk a little bit more perhaps about what kind of what you want to see in the sample pages i'd like to uh to know know something about that and then you know the other second part of that would be um you know is there anything in particular on the positive side beyond what you've already said succinctness flap copy like uh, uh, succinctness. Uh, beyond that, is there anything else you would add? I would say unlike flap copy, it's probably best to resist the urge to over editorialize your work. Like agents have a little more latitude in throwing in adjectives and more hyperbolic descriptions, hyping a work. But when an author does it to an agent, it's not the same thing. I think it comes across um, as a bit you it's always better to I guess under promise and over deliver in that sense so um, yeah that would be my one thing I see that it's probably best for writers to steer clear of all right anything anyone wants to add on this the query letter and we haven't I gone to sample pages yet but let's I you think know, it we'll might I think we may have implied this earlier, but I think also part of the query letter is to try to make it feel personal. I know that's not an easy thing to do. And Karen mentioned, you could certainly say, I, you know, I'm a fan of X author of yours, but I think, and that it also relates to what Reiko said about not making it sound too hypey. You're really making a personal plea to someone to take several hours out of their time to read your book explain why we should feel that. And the best way to do that is to make some sort of personal connection. Um, it's not an easy thing to, thing to do in a letter, but 
in a way, I think, again, writing that query letter may be the most important thing a, a, a writer does because that's how mm. it's that, that, that book, those sample pages will get looked at. So it's taking a lot of craft on that query letter and thinking of the craft of writing that as important in a way as the craft of writing it, coming up with the right voice uh, for the query letter is, is pretty uh, important. Can I just ask again about the ideal uh, uh, length of the sample pages you'd like to see or anything else you would like to say about that? I think well, in, I, I think in terms of that, you really want to visit every agent's website and what they ask for. Yeah, there is nothing standard in this business when it comes to that. There is something. I mean, you've, you've even heard we all like different things in a query letter, but I think there's an agreed kind of way that you make the query. But in terms of the sample pages, every agent's going to be different. Some want 10 pages and the bulk of it, some want an attachment. Um, some don't want any, some want a long synopsis. I personally hate synopsis. So, you know, for all of those kind of very specific things, go to the um, agents, um, the website for the agency, look under each agent, because even each agent at our agency has a different way um, of querying and look at that. And it's, I will give a little hint. I mean, part of how we also know that you've done your research is if you query us in the way that we ask to be queried. And when it's a generic um, submission, um, we know that. And it could mean a thousand other agents are going to look at it. And I'm not sure I really want to spend my time responding to that because a thousand, you know, if it's good, you know, a lot of people are going to ask to read it. And do I want to get into, you know, that, you know, spend my entire weekend when I could be reading something else where somebody is coming to me who cares deeply that I represent their book and go fight, you know, over something else, which I certainly will fight if I love something. But, it, you know, it's again, it's that personal connection. So if somebody comes to me with a query that's not asking for the way that I want it, I also know they haven't done their due diligence in how to come to me. So I will give you all a little hint, be sure you do it to each agent the way they ask, because I think we are all going to see that you have cared deeply about giving it to us in the way that we ask for it. And that's one helpful step in the door. And Michael, also, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. you go Karen, you go this time. Um, this may be obvious, I, I think this is obvious, and yet many people do it. It's not a great idea to query someone and say, I've sent this to 27 agents and 27 agents have passed on it. Are you gonna be the one that sees the genius in my work? And I understand what they're getting at, right? Like they think that they're sort of challenging me, except what I see is, okay, I'm your 28th choice. Um, and 27 people said, no, I don't think so. So that starts me off thinking, Ah, uh, if this is amazing, somebody else is probably going to have leapt on it. So there's really no reason to tell someone you're pretty far down on my list of, you know, who I've chosen to send to. And the other thing that I'm going to say, and this could just be me, uh, please use a very simple, readable font. Sometimes people really think they're being clever and doing something very uh, flowery or cute or interesting or bold. I just want it in Times New Roman personally, so that I don't have to worry about translating it for my iPad or doing some things, uh, just something readable and easy. Miriam's right, we all get zillions of these a week. And it, the thing that makes it stand out is not going to be the font. So that's me. And don't copy a hundred agents on the email. I mean, it, it is amazing the things that we have seen. Don't call a book a novel, a fictional novel. I mean, there's just so many things that we repeatedly see these major mistakes of, you know, having, you know, a hundred other agents in the CC, um, not really understanding how to call, you know, how to actually you know, talk about your book. It's it's just things like this that are going to make us question whether or not this is going to be a workable relationship. Um, but yeah, well, I guess that's sort of encouraging because if you're getting all of that, you know, 
I mean that that I mean that's sort of a fast sweep out, right? I mean the, the yeah, but you know what? It's down. filling up my inbox and it's making it really hard for me to find the things. I mean, it's amazing. People send me sci science fiction. They send me thrillers. They send me you know things that I clearly have no interest in. And when I open my inbox and I see seventy five new queries, sometimes it's just really hard. You know, I mean, we're tired, and so to if if. If I only got the queries that were actually what I like to represent, it would actually be much more workable for me. And it would benefit every you know, author out there who is trying to reach an agent because our inbox are flooded with things that I have no interest in. Yes, I could just sit and delete it, but that all takes time. And that takes my time away from finding and, and reading the writer's works that really are something that could potentially be right for my list. Well, this is. I would so also say, sorry, just one more back to Michael's question about, um, about the sample pages. I would say, certainly, yes, go take a look in what, about what each agent asks for. But certainly, the sample pages should start with page one of your novel, um, which is not always the case. People I, absurdly will sometimes send, here's my favorite chapter, chapter seven. Um, no, it's got to be the beginning of the book. And as I'm sure people have learned in other venues, it should start strong. It should start strong. You, the goal here is to make the agent think, oh, my God, I need to read more of this. OK, well, we could probably devote a, a, the whole session to this, but we, you know, let's move on to some other topics. And actually, I just do want to touch on the slush pile, the dreaded slush pile, which is where you know, most um, new novels, novelists or, or authors who don't have a personal connection, that's where their, um, that's where their submission is going to end up. And um, you sort of alluded to the fact that you get what 150 a week. And how do you manage the slush pile, especially now in a digital age where you don't have to pay for postage. So you probably get like multiples more than, you know, in another era. And um, it, it sounds like you don't have an assistant to help vet, vet it or go through it. So how how do you manage that? And um, how many offers of representation? Excuse me. How many offers of representation do you think um, actually come through the slush pile? Oh, no one wants tough. to answer that it's, question. Well, it's, a, it's, a, no, it's a very it's a very tough question because yeah we get we all get hundreds um, maybe not hundreds a week but probably between 50 and 150 a week, um, which, you know, and those numbers add up. You take a week's vacation, you come back, it's 300, it's, it's, it's rough. And, you know, it's different depending on who the agent is and their workload, they may have an assistant that goes through it first, um, or some agents prefer to just look through, the, look through it themselves. I've sometimes said to, uh, to my assistants, in the best of all worlds, I would have the time to do this myself because what I think I'm really good at is spotting talent. And, you know, people who are just starting out, maybe that's not necessarily, we haven't proven that yet. Um, but I don't, I don't have time to do what Miriam was pointing out to, which is for the most part going off and deleting or, or uh, 145 of the 150 and maybe asking to see five of them. And in the, maybe in the best of all worlds, I might want to read more of one of them. I don't know. I mean, I've, I will say I have I have taken on several clients who've become successful that were, came from a, a blind query letters. Um, it certainly is not. It is rare as a numbers game in terms of what are the odds you will be one of the that 150 any one week. Yeah, the odds are terrible. Um, but it's not an odds game because of those 150, most of them will not be publishable books. Um, if somebody writes what really is a great publishable book and positions it properly, not only we, but agents all over town will be saying, please, I wanna read this. The, the, the industry is about people who wanna read really good writing. So it's just putting that face forward in a way that, uh, that is appealing and that cuts through is the, is the job. Um, I am a little unusual in that I do read all of my slush, absolutely all of it. And I, I think that you can't do this job unless you are 
at least a 98% optimist, right? And so I feel like every single email that I open could be the next, you know, beautifully written bestseller. So I am just going to give hope to people and saying, I'm going to read whatever is sent to me. I'm not necessarily going to read a novel, but I'm certainly going to read the query. And in all likelihood, I'm going to read the five pages that are appended to that. Um, because I think to myself, it's just five pages. I can read five pages of all 700 queries in my inbox. That's fine. Um, and I have definitely taken on numerous authors from Slush, and some of them have been quite successful. Um, yes, if you're looking at percentages, more of the authors I take on are through referrals. Um, but I, again, each time I open that email, it's with the hope that this is the one. Well, that is very helpful. And I think that's, um, you know, that's, you know, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we have a question, um, a couple of questions, um, or a couple of pe people have questions about if you have uh, the self-publishing versus traditional publishing versus hybrid publishing. And, you know, that whole um, publishing world has changed in that way. Um, if you have a prior book published either traditionally with a hybrid publisher or self-published, um, Susan Maiden wonders, um, can you then be considered for traditional publication? I'm sure the answer to that is yes. But then the question also um, from Jeff Schneider is, if an author has a prior book published what should you mention in your query letter about that? And um, and how, how do you guys, what, what are your thoughts on, on that? Someone who's had something, you know, I would say it's more hybrid or, or, or um, self-published. Is that something they should mention? Does it matter? How, how do you view that? I would say, and it's a very touchy question because it's, it, it, there's, there's so many levels at which this, this operates. Um, I think if someone has self-published a book and it's been available on Amazon and elsewhere and has not sold well, they have hurt themselves pretty seriously in the marketplace because publishers basically say, well, this is not, I can't go out anymore and say, wow, here's something that's never been seen, even though effectively it hasn't been. Um, it is just a psychological difference that this book has been in the market and people didn't respond. So my instinct, I don't want to tell anybody to lie, but my instinct would be just don't mention it. <laughs> Maybe up front. Um, you, if you, you, you would mention to your agent if your agent then becomes interested in the book. Uh, even that, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to go through a whole process, love a book and then have a guy tell me it's been, it's been self-published. So I'm not even sure if, if I'm if I'm giving the right answer there. So I'm um, sorry. Just let me clarify. So this is a, if the book has been self-published, you you at that point you don't you don't submit that same book it's because it's been it's well, been you published. Can. You're well, asking about about their next book. Yes. Is that what, so you're so you've self-published. But, but I'm book. making an assumption. Yeah, but I'm also making an assumption that if it has been you know self-published, you know at that point isn't it kind of like an orphan book? I mean, it's been out there. Like that's not. There are yes, some but cases many people of books where many. the book was done. Okay, let's let's take turns. Okay, so let's go to Karen and Rico. Rico hasn't had the chance, so let's go from Karen to Rico to Miriam to Brian. Okay. I, I'm just going to be quick and say you'd be surprised. Many people actually submit books saying. Um, I self-published this, but I'm ready to take it to the big time now, and I'm hoping that you're going to help me get it there. And that is a, a really, really um, challenging task, and almost never is something that an agent's willing to take on. Reka, what's your experience with this? I haven't had a case where I took on a client who's been self-published, but I would say, just generally speaking, even if a client has been traditionally published and done a deal on their own with a traditional publisher, agents are always looking at track record and thinking about track record and how hard that's gonna to be to overcome if it's, you know, the first book didn't sell well, like let's say it was with a smaller or indie press, a first novel, and then they're out on submission to agents with their second novel. Um, not to say that it can't be overcome, maybe that first novel, if it sold, you know, 2000 copies got glowing reviews um, or, you know, an award. But I think 
it's it's generally a difficult a difficult thing. Um, I don't know the right answer to it either. Mm. So interesting, yeah. interesting. Um, Miriam, do you had something you want to say? And Brian, I mean, if somebody felt first self-published their first book and it didn't well it is a challenge but you know some people grow as writers and so I wouldn't dismiss a second book um if I really love the pitch they might have learned a really hard lesson um or you know every you want people to grow as they write their book so it wouldn't deter me it would it can be a challenge but if the book is really different and they've you know really found a, you know written a great book it wouldn't make me not do it because i think the large publishers that we go to will understand they self publish that's really hard to do and now we're going you know we're going to a more traditional way and the book will speak for itself i don't think there are situations where a first book has been self published and it's done extremely well. And some people go, oh my God, my book has sold 500 copies. Now I want to, you know, move it over to a traditional house. That's that's not how it works. I mean, it's got to sell, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 copies. And when that happens, what happens is readers go into bookstores and they ask for a book that has been self-published. And then the bookstore can ends up talking to sales reps of different publishing houses and says, this book is actually working. And the sales rep will go to the editor and an editor will go to an agent friend. And all of a sudden it goes through these backdoor channels and an agent's going to find that author. And like Colleen Hoover was one of them. So, you know, it can turn into something that then can be published, but it's got to be at such a high level and such a you know, level of thousands and thousands of copies and not the 500, 2000, even 5,000 copies that some people kind of toot their horn about. But even though, I mean, it's hard to take the self-published author and fall in love with the next book and, and publish it in the same way as Reiko said, if the first book, even by a large house, hasn't done well, you're going to have challenges the next time. So you have to look at it. Is this the book to make that transition with? Is this book different enough from the other book? Can we sell this book in a way that the other book wasn't sold? There's so many factors and ways that we have to look at it to reposition a book. Um, when we have sales figures, whether it's self-published or a book that ha didn't sell well with no fault to the author, you know, the publishers, the ones with the publicist, the marketing team, they, we, we all know in this industry, they don't put everything behind every book. And so sometimes when a book doesn't work, it's absolutely no fault of an author. Um, but again, it's engaging us, make, having us fall in love with this book and saying, this book is going to, is doing something that the last book didn't, we can, you know, we can reinvent the wheel on this one. And that's something that we look for in the process. Yeah, Tanya, when I responded to your question up front, I also thought you were talking about someone who comes and wants us to find a publisher for a book that they've already self-published unsuccessfully, which happens all the time. Mm -hmm. I do think that, you know, listen, we, I, I, I would say unfortunately, because I do, I actually do think it is unfortunate for many authors' careers, uh, you know, in 20 years ago, many authors would have written two novels that were not yet ready to be published and would be in their drawer and no one would have seen it. Now those books get self-published and unfortunately, I think kind of make it, make it a little harder for them to go out with the third novel that's finally ready. Uh -huh. um, but that may be, listen, it, it, that's the job of an agent to connect with them and figure out how to overcome that. No, it's fascinating, really interesting perspective. Um, yeah, I'm glad. Thank you to those who asked the questions and for your answers. Um, let's go to a question from Ken Schept. Ken, are you on with us? I am. Okay. Uh, so, well, thank, uh, thank you. Uh, I've learned a lot and I understand how hard agents work. I particularly wanted to thank uh, Miriam because actually you have read a couple of careers of mine and the first five or so pages and you've always taken the time to respond in a kindly way. And I know I can, I've heard how busy everybody is. So thank you. My question is, given the, the scope of the work that you do, how do you allocate your time between the authors that you already read, uh, represent and need to support and those of us who are sending you queries? And the second part of that is, if, if given that allocation, what's the best day of the week 
and time of the day for us to send you that query. Not on Christmas Day. Not on Christmas. <laughs> New Year's Day. Thanks. I'm glad you mentioned that. I would have sent it. <laughs> Um, really, um, really tough question. It's uh, a very yeah. tough question. I mean, yeah. you know, our industry is based on personal taste. Uh, you, as a reader, it's based on personal taste. You go into a bookstore and everybody wants a different book and you right. read a review and you say, I completely disagree. It's the, what I love so much about this business is that it is so personal and what one person's, you know, loves another person doesn't. And we, you know, you, you're in a book group yourself and you will continually argue about what you love and don't love about a book. So, you know, there is, there's a lot of these things, there's not really cookie cutter answers, um, which is what I think I love so much about our industry. It's personal taste and it's, it's intuition and it's, it's chance. Um, and so there isn't really kind of one way to do it. I, I do think that, um, so the, uh, the second question is, you know, it doesn't help to send, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't, I, if I want to work on a weekend, it's my choice, but don't send things over the weekend because then it's just going to pile up by Monday. Don't mm -hmm. send it over holidays where we really want to be with our family in our own time. It, it doesn't help you. It, it, it's going to hurt you because I'm going to think if this author is sending me something on Thanksgiving day, what kind of author are they going to be, you know, when I'm representing them? Are they going to be calling me on Thanksgiving when I want to be with my family? You know, there is a reason there's a draft place in your computer. There's a reason where yeah. You can, you know, write something over a weekend and send it on a Monday or Tuesday, but be respective of our time. You're only going to just, I personally, I feel like be respect ever, even more so after COVID, you know, we all work so hard and around the clock. All of our jobs are so much harder since COVID, so much more time consuming. So I will say, I'm not going to say there's a, a day of the week. I think everybody's schedule is very different, but I will say, I don't really want to hear from people on the weekends and holidays um, and to be respectful of the fact that we don't necessarily, if we choose to be working, it's because it's what we want to be doing and not because we're getting emails. Um, Miriam, I just want to jump in. I'm just curious because um, when you said your um, jobs have gotten so much harder since COVID, I'm curious, maybe an obvious question, but but why why is that? Um, well, that's a whole separate question. Okay, I'm yeah, happy, it is. I'm I happy, know. I was just I'm really happy curious. To that, but um, just to go back, Ken, what was the first part of your question? Well, I was. I wanted to know how you allocate your time between. Oh, allocate. Um, you know, again. It, it, every client, week changes because my yeah. workload changes every week. I yeah. can have a really heavy, you know, email. Uh, I could be launching a huge book. And so I get backed up and I may miss a couple of weeks of queries, or I may have a really slow work week where I don't have something coming out, or I could be on vacation and come back to double the load. So there's, there's no rhyme or reason. I will say it's very hard. I personally have a hard time reading and editing during the workday because emails are coming in fast and furious. So it is my nights and weekends. And so that's why it's so precious that we take on books that we really fall in love with, um, because that's oftentimes not on the workday hours. So it's not like there's query Wednesday. It's not like it's more yeah. like Walmart. There's no, it, it can be any place and you slot it in. We slot yeah. it in on our time because our every, I mean, again, what I love about my job is no two, no two days and no two hours are the same. And so I, I read and I look at queries and I edit when I either have the time or maybe I've just had a really hard day and I just wanna read something I love, you know, it's- But you all have um, developed, uh, you know, your, your writers and you have a responsibility to those clients. How much is really left over? I would imagine, well, as a percentage, how much goes to what you really have to do? And Brian, it's an why don't you it's answer an interesting that? Yes, yeah, an interesting question, Ken, because, you know, it, 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 you, and you're right. And logically, that leads to a place which sometimes people understand and go toward and some don't, which is, you know, everybody wants an agent who has a sterling client list of 20 best-selling authors. 
and they want that person to be their agent. Well, if that's the person you go query, they're the person who's going to have the is going to be least likely to have the time to respond to you. So, you know, those of us who've been in the business a long time and have a big client list, we do, as Miriam said, we, listen, we all still very much want to find new clients, but we have to do it in the time when we are not dealing with the clients we already have, which tends to be a smaller percentage of our day. And the newer, younger agents um, are spending more of their time trying to cultivate mm. a list. Right. So it, right. you know, that's, that's a better way to find, find a way in, um, certainly. Thank Karen you. or I'll Rachel, have, do you want to add? I will just say, I know there are agents out there that have the discipline to say, at 12 o'clock every Tuesday and Thursday, <laughs> I'm going to apportion yeah. X amount of time. I admire that. It's not, I, I wish I could be that in control of my day um, and I'm not, but that does exist for some people. And it is a huge push pull for us of wanting to support our authors. And that is really, you know, that that's where we are making our money because this is actually a business, right? And so we have to um, service the clients that are actually making the money. But at the same time, you're thinking, what's in that inbox that I have not gotten to that could be amazing? And so you're always trying to sort of take a quick look at that and think, okay. And then in fact, this sort of, for those of you who wonder, what is taking this agent so long to get back to me? Sometimes we'll take a really quick look and say, okay, is this something I need to address right this second? No, I don't think so. And then it somehow falls to the bottom of the list and it takes a while to get back there and really give it the time that it deserves. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, I we are actually coming up on nine o'clock and um, maybe we could just stay on just to ask, get at least one more question from our audience. And I, um, but before that, I really don't think we can close without touching on the question of social media and how important is that for an, a fiction author to have a social media presence and do you look for example for a certain threshold of followers on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook or any other platform? I don't think it's crucial for a novelist honestly. Um, I don't think it's crucial it's, or it's necessary really for anybody for certain sorts of nonfiction, perhaps. I mean, I've had some pretty big successes with clients that have grown out of social media phenomenons, but um, that, that's a different thing. Um, I don't think, at least for me, and I think I would speak for most agents I know, um, there's no requirement. It's like, I would never say to an author, oh, you have to have a certain number of Instagram followers before I'll uh, look at your work. Um, in fact, sometimes I'm much more interested in someone who says, I don't know what Instagram is, because I've been sitting here writing this novel um, and, the, and the novel is great. Uh, I, pu publishers like a big social media following because it's a quick and easy way to get attention of people who know who that author is. Um, it makes it an easier book to market. That's the real advantage. So it certainly is helpful, um, but it's not a requirement. Okay. That's a nice, easy answer. We like that. Um, <laughs> maybe we could go to Athena Gizar, and I'm sorry with, if I'm mangling your name. Um, I, it's come through the chat here. Athena Gizar Ablang. Um, Jenna, can we bring Athena on? Yes, just give me one second. Okay. All right, Athena. Athena, are, are you with us? She might have had to go. Okay. Well, yeah. you know what? Okay. Um, I'm sort of scrolling through. Oh, wait. Our oh, wait. Athena's oh, here. Awesome. <laughs> All right. And Athena, please introduce yourself without and my mangling your name. And unmute, oh, please. <laughs> did I unmute? I'm so sorry. You're good. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so it's Athena Gazar Oblong. Um, I graduated into the pandemic, so that was really fun. Um, but yeah, so my question was, you know, is there anything that's coming to your inbox or that is uh, 
you know, whether it's your inbox or whether it's on the market even just now that you feel either the genre itself or just a particular storyline seems oversaturated to the market. And perhaps, you know, they're, uh, whether the market or readers are ready for something different, um, I'd be interested to hear your opinion. Uh, Reiko, you want to take a stab at that? Uh, I need to think about, that's a really good question. I need to think about it. Okay, we'll start with um, <laughs> any, either any of the other three of you. Uh, I can, I'll just say that I think that we're all, personally, I want to, I want to find the thing that hasn't, you know, I'm, I'm always looking for the thing that hasn't been, I'm, I, I'm not a trend person. Um, and the thing you have to recognize in publishing is by the time you write a book and we sell it, it can take a year, if not more to edit it. And it can take 18 months to publish it. So you can, from the time you finish a book, the process of finding an agent, the process of finding an editor, which could be you know, a day or a year or two years to editing it and publishing it, you're looking very far out. And so it's so important for authors. I mean, it's one thing if you're a genre ed, you know, author, if you're writing in romance or mystery. Yeah. I mean, even there, we're all looking for the, the, we want you to be the next trend. We want you to be the person who has discovered the thing that nobody has done before that's gonna break through all the barriers. It's gonna be the thing that everybody's talked about. Um, and that's, to me, the simple answer of it is I don't look for the things that are there or I look for the things, I want your book to be the one that's really going to be the driving force in the marketplace. Okay, anyone else want to weigh in on that? Just, just that I, I very much agree with that. By the time you spot a trend, it's over. Um, as far as publishing is is concerned, uh, the, the you, you, you know, sometimes, uh, we've all been lucky where you where you've had a book that just seems to be the right book for the moment. Uh, usually, it's not in any way because it was planned that way. Um, it's just that somebody wrote a book that just seems to be at the right time in the right place, what the world, uh, where the world is at the moment. But it, it, I, I really firmly believe you can't plan it. I will say Brian is totally right. By the time you spot a trend, it's over. And if you're devastated because you have a vampire novel that is the vampire novel, don't worry because it will come back, right? Like it will be over and it will be dead and buried and everyone will say, I don't want that again until six years later when they'll say, oh my gosh, this is great. It's coming back. So nothing is ever like sometimes it should be, but nothing is ever actually put to rest. Much like the vampires themselves. <laughs> uh, I guess it depends what trend you're talking about too, because it could be very like, you know, a vampire novel, or it could be a much more general trend, like the trend towards more diverse voices and literary fiction, which is a whole nother thing. And that doesn't seem like it's just gonna fizzle out tomorrow. Um, or, you know, like I personally think, and I'm excited about this because I have a huge soft spot for story collections, I think, or um, during the pandemic, and I think it still holds, people are looking for more escapist fiction, you know, that um, is not super grounded in, in, in the world. They don't necessarily want to read, read a literary pandemic novel unless you're like Gary Steingart. So, um, I guess it depends what trend, if it's towards a genre or a very specific storyline, that's probably gonna fold in on itself and move on quickly. But if it's something more overarching that's in the culture of publishing and filtering down like the movement towards diversity, I think that that's hopefully here to stay. I don't know if that answers any question, but yeah. Oh, great, good, great question, Athena, and great answers. Okay, let's do um, one speed dating round with like yes, no answers um, for two questions that are kind of interesting. And then um, and then a final word and we will say good night. So the speed dating question is um, from Nahal Bari. She wondered if agents are held to, excuse me, are, are held to confidentiality standards when they pitch a book, which is actually a kind of interesting question because there is this thing with authors 
that, you know, you're putting your work out there and there's very little protection, right? I mean, this is a larger question for creative artists in all <laughs> disciplines. So quick answer on that. I'm not sure what the, really what the question means, because obviously if we're reading someone's work and they want us to agent it, we will need to talk about it. So I'm not sure what you mean by- Yeah, well, you, actually that's, a good, means by yeah, that's a good question. I don't know, is Nahal on, Jenna? Do you know if we see it, Nahal? Let me, uh, let's see. This came through, you know, this was, she was sent in ahead of time, um, but you know, Brian, yeah, that's a really good question. Of course, you have to talk about the book. Um, um, well, I think what we've heard about, I'll just say what we've heard about like in film, in the film industry is that ideas are stolen, but. The only thing that I will say, you know, in this industry, our reputation is everything, right? And so if you are an agent who takes an idea of an author and gives it to one of your other authors, say, right? Because it's, most agents are not going to write the book themselves. That's going to get out and that is not going to go well for you in, in subsequent years, right? So we're all, uh, there's a pretty high ethical standard that I think everyone that I know in this industry adheres to. So I know it's scary to send your stuff out there because you feel like, oh my gosh, this is my unique idea and somebody will take it. I always tell people <laughs> there's no, it is so unlikely that somebody, somebody on the agenting side would. Now, every once in a while you hear somebody a big author taking something that a small author did, that's not usually an agent that is contributing to that. In fact, an agent is fighting against it usually. Okay, that's it. Let's call that a wrap. That's a perfect answer. Great. And I hope that um, that helps Nahal feel a little bit less, feel a little bit more confident in submitting. Um, and a super easy question. We actually got this in, in the Q&A um, from several different people. Um, I can answer this, so I know you guys can. Should your novel, your manuscript be absolutely polished and finished before you query? Or can you query when it's partially done? <laughs> How about we just it do it? Done. It, it, it should, should be done. It should be done, right? It should be done. It's gotta be done, 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 that, done. That, that, that is the best answer. There are cases in which a magnificent first hundred pages uh, grabs the attention of the publishing world, but it's really rare. Okay. You're only encouraging yourself to try it that way. Right. I mean, I think that's, again, you can do look do a little research on the internet and that's going to be a pretty easy answer. Um, it, it does raise a question though. Um, you know, Karen, you're saying you do a lot of editing with your clients and mm -hmm. yet we, we authors should send their pieces, you know, their manuscripts in as done as possible. Um, what would make you take on a, a, a work that actually needs a lot of work? Like why, why, you know, you know, what is, why would you do that? If I see the potential in something, and I often say to people that I see how to fix this, right? Ah. And, and sometimes I will see something and say, I think that's really good. I don't know what to say to do. I don't know where you should go with this. So I'm not the right agent for you because I, I don't know what to advise you. But if I can look at something and say, oh my gosh, if they only, you know, mm. if that character actually made this different decision, it would impact everything differently. And if I can see a way through it, then I would take it on. What fun, what fun to have a, a, an agent who actually can you know, see your book that way. That's really cool. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? I would answer it in a very similar way, which is that I would think if I sense that the novelist has grabbed my attention and is a storyteller and has a voice, but the plot goes wrong in some place, then I feel like, okay, I can help them guide the plot in a direction that will that will end in a more satisfying place right? or, or, or something. I'm not know exactly what, whatever the problem is that I see that I think might hurt it in the marketplace. I would talk to the client and say, the potential client and say, here's what I envision might make this book more successful. I'd be willing to do the work with you, but, the, but primarily I'd have to feel like, oh boy, this person has talent. Oh. Okay. Anyone else want to weigh on that? In on that before we say good night. I think that's it. I think that's a wrap. Wow, you guys, thank you so much. I learned. If there's nothing, you know, you can do research on the internet forever, but but 
what you all shared with us this evening is incredibly valuable. And, um, you know, I learned a lot and I'm sure our audience did. So thank you so much. And um, you can be expecting, I think, some queries in your inbox sometime over the next year because everyone's <laughs> got to get their manuscripts really polished. Um, thank you so much and um, stay warm. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.